My name is Kira Benzing, and uh, I guess you might call me the leader of this team right now. Uh, all of our virtual and physical versions of ourselves, as we build this crazy story world one, one light forest at a time. Um, I, I've been working with Alyssa Landry for years here with Double Eye Studios, and we've been growing our team to um, to you know create these interactive virtual stories. So I'm the founder of Double Eye Studios, and we like to make interactive stories that have a meaningful element to them. We like to focus on stories that are collaborative and community oriented and uh, and interactive. So those are the, the kind of hallmarks for us. And this production uh, grew out of uh, other work we'd been doing with VR theater, merging these fields for the last several years. We had a piece at in 2019 at the Venice Film Festival called Love Seat. And then prior to that, I'd done and directed work for a platform called High Fidelity. Uh, and we, we were experimenting with mixing VR and theater. And also prior to that with Double Eye, we were merging those things before in a game called Metropoles. So this production, Finding Pandora X, continued to evolve out of all of this other work. And I'm the director and producer of this production. Okay, let's go next to uh, Alyssa. Hi. <laughs> So yes, I met Kira quite a few years ago now, maybe five or six. Um, we were working together on a, a project that was um, spearheaded by Lance Weiler at, and the Columbia, Columbia um, Digital Storytelling Lab. Uh, it was called Sherlock Holmes and the Internet of Things. And Kira and I just hit it off. We were on the same wavelength. And after that collaboration, we were like, we have to keep working together. We have to keep, and we were just brainstorming and brainstorming. And, and finally she said, hey, how about, you know, you come on one of my projects. And that was sort of the beginning of this wonderful collaboration that we've had. Um, that was with Cardboard City at, at Lincoln Center and the New York Film Festival. And um, it was our first AR experience. Uh, and what I've noticed about all the work that we do with Double Eye, just to bounce off what you had said, is that there is a huge um, drive to connect people and to have it be a group, um, a, a group experience. And it's been that way with every single thing. Uh, and as we've moved into more VR uh, productions, that is also part of it, because VR can be a very solitary experience. And, and all of the work that Kira and Double Eye Studios do is a group collective experience and we're very focused on how do we get that group and that collective to work together to collaborate to talk to each other and to share um so just to to you know add on to a little bit of what drives double life studios work fantastic and over to mark and welcome jonathan oh hey john um, um yeah so i'm mark sternberg i'm the developer and tech producer on Finding Pandora X. Um, I actually knew Kira back when we were both in the film world, and um, it was interesting because we both sort of made the transition into VR around the same time. Um, I started out mostly doing 360 video work because 360 video was sort of like an easy transition from, um, you know, from film to uh, six degrees of freedom because you have to like learn game programming and stuff. But eventually I sort of moved on from even 360 video and did you know, take the plunge, learn Unity, and all of those sorts of things. And um, yeah, so my role on uh, this project and also on Love Seat, you know, is to help to create some of the interactivity that the audience sees. Um, and here, you know, we're trying to make an experience that's open for a wide audience. So it was a lot of thought process that went into, you know, how do we engage the audience as part of this production um, and still drive the narrative forward. So it's been a really great experience. Wonderful. Um, Jonathan, would you like to introduce yourself next? Sure, I'd love to. My apologies for getting in a little bit late. Technical difficulties are always part of uh, exploring in the virtual medium. And um, it's amazing how they can follow you even outside of VR. Um, so, yeah, so I'm Jonathan David Martin. I'm a performer in Finding Pandora X. I play the role of Zeus, who's that handsome blue devil behind me. Um, <laughs> and um, I also worked on Love Seat with uh, Kira and everyone at, at Double Eye Studios. 
And uh, uh, my background is I come from a live performance background mostly and uh, as a creator and performer in theater. I've worked uh, as a performer and puppeteer on Broadway and War Horse, uh, performed a lot uh, on region at regional theaters around the country, uh, also as a producer of uh, live performance with a company that I run called Smoke and Mirrors Collaborative that creates new works around contemporary social issues. And in the last few years, been uh, moving more and more into uh, augmented and virtual reality mediums. Amazing. Um, and Vaughn, how about yourself? There we go. Uh, I, I'm Vaughn Schmidt. I'm new as of last summer. Uh, I do some VR environment design and uh, programming, uh, focusing on VR chat as a platform, just because that's what I got really interested in. And uh, I started making tutorials uh, last, yeah, it was last year now. Um, and they, uh, Kira, um, I don't remember if it was Kira or was it Laura who reached out to me originally, uh, but I was brought on board to help out with the, uh, all the fancy buttons and stuff for the environments that they wanted. So it's been pretty entertaining. <laughs> yeah, it, it was funny. I was actually watching your tutorial videos uh, and then I was like, oh my God, we need him on the team. He's like one of the most talented VR chat developers. I know. So when he says he did some, it's like, he's our expert. We turn it to him for, <laughs> you know, every question, let's ask Vaughn. So. <laughs> Great. Um, Thank you. And then, you know, the expression, uh, save the exec for last. <laughs> so <laughs> um, Joanna, the fabulous executive producer on this project, please introduce yourself. Hi, everybody. My name is Joanna Popper, and I am at HP on the virtual reality team. I lead up our initiatives around go to market and location based entertainment. And so we have been working um, in virtual reality, releasing products like the HP Reverb G2 and our backpacks and all of the of compatible uh, computers and, 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 and other, other products in VR and working with great teams like this one. You know, we've been supporting different teams at film festivals or to conferences. And, and we're and first met Kira when she was working on running, when the team was working on running and supported them in some of those initiatives through our partnership with Intel and then supported the team at, at Love Seat at Venice in 2019 with lots of computers and headsets and making sure that their their creative vision could come to life on top of some great technology and so um, supported the, the the team and the the actors and the, the technical folk and everybody with with the, the devices that could help them run the show this time um, and so what excited me about this vision and what the team was doing was was you know, for us, we see VR as a way to, to connect, to collaborate, to create, and to learn. And this team was, you know, in that sweet spot of all of it and, and, and continuing to push innovation by bringing people together, no matter where they were around the world, to be able to interact with this great artistry. So we're thrilled to be working with this team on this triple award winning project. Cool, and I'm honored to get to talk to you all about it. Um, just a little brief introduction of myself. I'm Eve Weston. Um, I am also a creator in the immersive space. I created the first 360 VR sitcom. We didn't have Six Degrees of Freedom, which, which Kira and her team used. And so it's really like gonna be a pleasure to get to speak to you about how you use those extra layers of interactivity and immersion in your stories. Um, I am also a, um, a professor of VR and immersive storytelling and television writing. I have a background writing for television sitcoms, um, and I've authored the Taxonomy for Immersive Point of View, which is used um, to help catalog and review immersive narrative content at the look.club, which is an online database of immersive narrative content. And we're very pleased to announce that with its US premiere, Finding Pandora X is now available in the searchable database and it's being featured on the site this weekend. Um, and so we're gonna give you a lot of information about the show here today, but if you're curious for more and you want a little summary of it, along with a little video kind of walking you through the experience, go there and check it out. Um, you know, any, any way that we can share and tell more people about this experience, we're so happy to. Um, so that's a little bit about me. Maybe um, I can, I don't want to spend too long on it, but I do feel like there are probably people tuning in who haven't had 
the chance to experience finding Pandora X because so many people haven't yet. It's just the beginning of this show's amazing journey. Um, and so I can just give you a, a kind of a very short walk through my experience. I got to, to do it the other week. Um, it's very exciting. You put on a VR headset and then you enter VR chat, which is an app um, and you and you follow one of your fearless leaders uh, into the, the space, sort of the, let's just call it the lobby outside Mount Olympus, um, where you put on a, a toga and get it into costume as you, in your role, which is a member of uh, the Greek chorus. So, you know, that alone is very different than going to the theater on Broadway, right? You might dress up, but you don't dress up as a member of the cast. Um, so that's really cool. And then you enter in to Mount Olympus and the, the drama begins and you're sort of told by the characters, by the gods on Mount Olympus, um, what the problem is and what they need to do. They've, they've lost hope effectively and everyone's at risk of disappearing if you can't help them find it. Um, and so this show is, is a little bit of a quest in a very cool way that a normal play couldn't be because you are instrumental in solving this quest. You are the one who's, um, Making, helping make decisions about where to go and what to do next. Um, and ultimately, I don't want to give spoilers, but let's just say it kind of works out in some unexpected and fun ways. And along the way, you get to have these really cool adventures where you're engaging one-on-one, -on -one, not only with the actors who are playing the Greek gods and goddesses, but also with your fellow theater goers. And that's kind of cool. I had the pleasure of both knowing some of them and not knowing others. And I enjoyed both. It was a chance to kind of bond with the people you already knew, um, but it was also kind of a fun way to like meet, make new friends in a way because you've gone through this experience together. Um, and that's, that is unlike a traditional theater going experience in a very exciting way. Um, so now I wanna take advantage of having all these amazing people with us um, and my first question is for Kira and Alyssa, most likely, um, you know, although of course, if anyone has anything to contribute, please do. Um, how did the idea for this show come about? That's a, that's a great question. So after we came back from Venice in 2019, we sat down as a team and we said, what do we really wanna dedicate our time to? We really wanna take more time. We wrote the production of Love Seed in three days, Mac Rogers. A New York City playwright wrote that production very fast and that was a 45 minute production and so we said okay we want to take more time and get this story right this time what do we really want to spend our time on so we asked the team to contribute ideas and we all came up with different types of themes and Laura and Mark said how about Greek mythology and Alyssa and I said that's great so we went down a, a Greek mythological rabbit hole for a while thinking about all the strong female characters we, we really wanted a strong female character and what we felt we could dedicate our time to for a while. Um, and the story of Pandora emerged, and that isn't actually what we've released right now. <laughs> that version of the story is not what we've done. Um, but I just want to uh, have Alyssa just share for a moment about where that kind of led us, because it is really interesting. Uh, originally, when we first started, when we first thought of Pandora, first of all, our, our immediate um, thought was, oh, there's all these boxes, we can do stuff with boxes, we can have the audience open boxes, and we started to do research on Pandora, which is when we realized that Pandora, actually the, the original oral tradition of Pandora, is not at all the what we know today, and that Pandora actually was a goddess-type figure who transported departed souls to the afterlife in jars. Um, and these were big, huge urns, actually. Um, and this just absolutely fascinated us. And we really went down a very big rabbit hole of we're going to tell Pandora's story and we're going to show how you can take control of your own story and that other people shouldn't be able to change your story. And it was all about female empowerment and then COVID hit. And everything that we had been thinking about, we couldn't do because what we wanted to do was have something that was mixing like Love Seat a live audience and a virtual audience and we had in fact been gearing up to do this with the la mama and culture hub in new york we were going to start experimenting with that first so we did a full pivot and we were saying okay so it's going to be really hard for us to tell pandora's story in the way that we wanted to so how can we use all of this research that we've been doing and still have an interesting story 
but now just focus predominantly on only a virtual audience. And that was where we started thinking about, well, what's been going on in Mount Olympus all this time? Ever since Hope disappeared and Pandora took it, what's been going on? And that was really the impetus for what became the story that we eventually told with Finding Pandora X. We have always seen this as an introduction to the Pandora story that we still hope to, to tell afterwards. Um, but that's for, you know, next year, perhaps. Uh, but in any case, that, that was where it happened was that pivot. And we thought actually, without even realizing, we've hit on the perfect theme for this time where we're all going into confinement and the Greek gods have been confined to Mount Olympus and they have lost hope. So how do you get hope back when you're, you know, confined and locked and there's only two of you in this marriage that is relatively dysfunctional um, how do you turn to others um, in a virtual way and how can they help you to recover hope what does it do to a marriage when you start working together to look for hope it was all those are all sort of little subtexts of things that we were wanting not to explore necessarily but maybe to trigger people to think about as they as they went through the experience what does that hope mean to you what would you do if you got hope back if you're not confined anymore where would you go what would you want um all of those questions that we've been thinking about we hope to give the audience little moments during the show where they can think about that as well amazing um that's I'm so glad I asked. <laughs> what an unexpected <laughs> origin story. Sorry, that was that was a little long-winded, but <laughs> No, it's great. Of all of all the rabbit holes, the Greek mythological rabbit holes are my favorite. Uh, <laughs> that was I majored in that in, co in college. So, it's right up my alley. Um, so I'm curious, Alyssa, um, not to not to keep you on the hot seat, but I promise I'll take you off it down the road. Um, could you tell us about the writing process for a unique show like this? I'm I and not, not just assume, I know it has some specific needs and unique concerns when you're writing for immersive and for interactive. Um, and you know, how, how did you go from, okay, this is, our new, this is our new idea for something that's all in VR to some sort of a, I imagine there's a, there was a script <laughs> that you were able, maybe not, but maybe there was a script that you handed off to the actors. What was that journey like? Um, so my, my writing experience comes predominantly from the world of theme parks, and I've worked extensively for Disney, uh, for Disneyland Paris, actually. So the whole process for writing immersive entertainment is something that is very, um, there's a very firm process in place for almost all theme park entertainment. And so it's that process that I automatically apply to um, writing for VR, and it's it starts off with sort of a high concept with a deck that has mood boards. Um, and Kira and I developed this entirely together of where do we want people to go? What do we want it to look like? What are some of the images? Um, a lot of it as, as um, the writer or as a narrative director is saying to the director, what do you want? What experience do you want the audience to have? So this is very much um, in collaboration with Kira and under Kira's guidance is what is this experience going to be? When we go into the two worlds, what do those two worlds look like? What do we want the audience to do? So there's a lot, that's like the biggest part is trying to figure out what we want the audience to feel, what we want them to do, how we want them to interact. Then once that part is done, um, I do what I call a show flow, which is a very detailed breakdown of what all the actions are going to be, who's going to say what, who's going to do what in terms of the characters, and the, and the action and when they will divide, you know, into a, a separate story world. And it's really um, that document that can be used as a guide for the technical team because now they know exactly who's going to be where, what they're going to do, at what point in the show they're going to break off or they need a certain prop. So in that show flow document, you put all of the information about um, props, music, light changes, um, you know, separating into worlds. And again, all of this completely done with Kira because she's directing the show. So um, as the writer and the narrative director, it is entirely my position to support um, the vision of Kira and to move that forward in a way that's really coherent and really clear. Um, 
for the first version of Finding Pandora X that we did this summer, there was so much to do that I didn't actually end up writing the dialogue. Someone else wrote the dialogue. Um, and I was really concerned with like, you know, what are the actions? Where is everybody going? And then because this is live theater and yeah. we are all still here for the second version at South by Southwest, I was able to take a second pass at the dialogue and really tweak it and, and what was really wonderful was to have been able to learn how the audience responded in Venice mm. and to take those lessons and say, okay, this is how they responded. This is the feedback we got. Now we're going to take a second pass at this story and provide more tension, make things clearer. The things that people didn't understand, we're going to try to make those clearer. So I, I feel that um, we're very, very lucky in, in the fact of doing a live piece because we can take those lessons and the actors were extremely, extremely grateful to them because they just went with it. We're like, yeah, let's try that. Let's, okay. <laughs> I remember when I, when Kira and I had finished like all the rewrites and we sent it to them, I'm thinking, oh my gosh, half of it has been highlighted as changes. They're going to be like, what? Um, but everybody just went with it and tried, you know, tried everything. Um, we again experimented with some new scenes that we probably won't keep for the future, but it's a wonderful it's really wonderful to have the opportunity to try things and to readjust um, given the audience feedback so that's been really really part of the process as well uh, and that has to do with it being live yeah that's it, amazing allowed to do that um, so so Kira once you had the script or I won't even, or maybe let's back up a step once you had the show flow document um, was it what came next did you bring on actors did you bring on developers which one came first did they come on at the same time <laughs> yeah we tend to work in a pretty parallel structure so jonathan basically has been with us since love seat he never left he's just he's just he's just become part of our team here and we you know as we would start to build things you know, I said to Mark, just give me a mountain. I just need a mountain and a green field. That'll make a stage. Like, I can't get him in New York. We're all spreading across the country due to the pandemic. So we just need, you know, and, and Joanna working with location-based, we just need a location, right? HP being location-based entertainment, we just need a venue. We just need a rehearsal stage. And it doesn't have to be pretty yet. It just needs to feel like a space we can rehearse. So Jonathan started coming in and we did these experiments in digital storytelling with Culture Hub and La Mama Theater. And we started to test some of the ideas that we wanted to do with a physical and virtual audience, but that kind of parallel structure of testing and playing and building and Alyssa writing everything all happened simultaneously. So basically I'd go from, uh, I think my team knows, I kind of just hop like from like one, uh, meeting and, and virtual space to the next and I'd go from you know a testing situation where Mark is trying to get the flying mechanic built and we're like testing that to you know uh, bringing Jonathan in and testing avatars and scale and like world hopping to try and get avatars or we're trying to bring an avatar designer on to Alyssa writing dialogue and us trying to figure out is this thing done in verse is it more modern language and like all of this stuff got play tested pretty much simultaneously in a pretty tight turnaround. So by the time that we started writing the version for Venice, which was not the show we first intended, but was supposed to be a kind of really short prelude of just two characters that grew into a cast of five with an additional two actors alternating roles. And the show was supposed to be a 20 minute prelude to the show we really wanted to write. Um, and that turned into an hour long production with a branching narrative and escape rooms embedded inside. So these were all things that were on a list of stuff we wanted to get to. Uh, and I guess I have the tendency to always shoot for the moon and put them all together on a really expedited timeline. And then sometimes we kind of fail along <laughs> the way. Like I think there's, there's mistakes that we make and we're like, this dialogue doesn't work. So then, you know, we, as Alyssa mentioned, we had more writers and then that dialogue didn't work. All these things were like doing them all at once until we figure out what sticks and then we get more fine tuned on that as a team. Wonderful. Um, so Jonathan, I'll ask you next, since you were a part of this, you know, fr from the beginning, 
Um, that's obviously a very different role than an actor on Broadway who is, you know, is cast when they're ready to start rehearsals um, and handed a script. So could you speak to the rehearsal process from the actor's point of view and, and feel free to interpret rehearsal broadly since <laughs> you may have been on board before other actors were there to rehearse with, for example? Yeah, um, yeah, you bring up a, a really interesting point about uh, that I'll, I'll sort of expand for a moment, which is about how how do you go about creating any kind of experience? Like what's gonna be your your development process? And um, I think one of the things that's been really exciting for me as an, as an artist is that I like to work really collaboratively and to be in a space where I'm working with collaborators who are um, not just inviting me in to interpret something as a performer in a very kind of confined way, but are saying the kind of work that we're creating and the kind of way that we're making it um, requires you to uh, you know, figure what this thing out is with us, like be a creative uh, uh, artist with us in the process. And that's the thing that um, I, I've really gotten to experience with, with this piece coming in um, really from the, that kind of early stage where we've got a little bit of writing and we've got a little bit of a set. We've got like the proto version of this mountain that you can see behind a lot of us. Um, and, and we're gonna test what this is. And of course, since the pandemic's just gonna ha just happen, we're gonna test something we weren't expecting to test. Um, and so let's let's just see what we find. And for me, that's really exciting. I'm, I'm happiest when I'm in a room and the, the answers aren't already known. It's not just following the blueprint and putting it out there. And I think that's that can be lovely, but what gets me really excited is when we really don't know. And so there's that iteration process that Kira talked about where each time we're, we're exploring, we're putting it out there and getting feedback really quick, way before we feel like uh, it's polished and it's ready. Um, and I think that's actually one of the things that's really valuable for anybody who's thinking about creating work um, in extended, uh, you know, uh, extended reality, VR, AR, is um, that iteration process and getting that, uh, that information back from, from an audience. Um, and for me as a performer, that was really valuable to have um, uh, that kind of focus on what, what am I understanding by my interaction from, with an audience from a very early uh, standpoint. And uh, that kind of continues to inform the show even as you know, we, we uh, you know, continue to perform a fully realized version of it. We're you know, still playing, tweaking, iterating. Um, and based on the kind of interaction that we have as performers with the audience, um, there's a lot of improvisation that happens from night to night. Some of that's been built in by Alyssa and Kira, and some of it is uh, happens because of um, just what happens right now in VR and the medium. There's always oh, like uh, when I couldn't that sit down. Little... <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. Like oh, somebody can't sit down in this moment where it probably is really important that they sit down. Well, we'll see what happens. <laughs> um, and it's it's sort of fascinating to uh, be able to be in character as Zeus and to be able to troubleshoot with somebody about their like their menu in VR chat. And that that's okay. Like there's this is a playful space where all of that is interesting and um, and still adds to the experience that the audience is having. That's one of the things that I found and continue to find uh, really unique about performing in VR in this piece. That is really interesting. I'm so glad you spoke to that because that was something I'd wondered about how much improvisation, because you you can tell when you're in it, it can't possibly all be scripted to a T. You know, that's just, so So it was the question was, you know, how much of it was built in that it's scripted and then here's an improv section or just as needed. Um, for, it, those yeah. for those improvisational moments that are quote, scripted in i mean obviously the, the lines aren't scripted but it, is there like a moment in the script that says actor improvises with audience or is it like a game of some kind where they're going to ask this question but then based on the responses it's a free-flowing back and forth like how are those shaped yes <laughs> as, as in it's both. Uh, there's a lot of different kind of improvisation sometimes it is Alyssa is specifically saying um, improv moment and it's about this here or this is the goal that we want from this interaction um, and it's uh, uh, you know that's that's a lot of how that kind of conversation will start around certain moments of improv sometimes it is specifically a game let's play this game with the with the audience in this moment um, uh, but I would say so there I are think moments. both of those kind of moments yeah. 
I was going to say there are moments when we're specifically asking the audience a question. And so it's impossible to script those moments. And that's something that Jonathan is really, really good at. Uh, you know, when, when, when we're saying to the audience, when he's saying to the audience, so, you know, is there another way? What should I do about Pandora? Give me some ideas. Give me, give me some ideas. There's no way to script that because there's no way to predict what the audience will come back with. Mm -hmm. um, so that would be a typical improvised moment is Jonathan just goes with whatever they throw at him. And then we have a lot of if then scenarios as well. So there's these puzzles that and puzzles and activities and things that happen in these escape room sections, these kind of adventure moments in the middle of the show when the audience splits in this branch. And we have a lot of if then situations. So it's kind of like if the audience figures this out, then you can respond according in this way. If they don't figure this out, then you should do this so they can help, we can move it along and we don't get stuck there for 15 minutes because the tracks have to funnel back into scene four so we can figure out what we've learned and bring our puzzle pieces together. That Usually makes sense. the audience yeah. figures it out. We've had some very smart audiences. Oh, yeah, they, I know. <laughs> and it's, it's, fun, it's fun to see how they figure it out. Um, uh, but, it, you know, especially actually in those the part of the show where we do have two different branching uh, narratives because the audience goes on a journey with, uh, with Hera and then half of them go on a journey with me to the underworld. Um, and, um, you know, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of improvisation, at least for me, that happens in that space since it really is kind of just me and the audience um, in, uh, in that space. And what has been interesting in that scene and in some other scenes as well is where there have been moments where I, I've, I've been improvising in order to connect one story beat to the next mm. and to watch how Alyssa is watch you know, follow that and then sometimes we'll then incorporate that uh, thing that started off as an improvisation then back into the script and built on it and refined it and so there's this really interesting dialogue that happens um, I've been finding between the two of us and then also with the audience who's kind of also feeding in uh, uh, their own dialogue on each show. I love that. Um, that's so great. Okay, I, I, gosh, I'm just gonna say I could sit here with you guys all day, um, <laughs> but I'm trying to be cognizant of time, so I'm gonna just tell, first of all, Mark, we're coming for you, but before we do, um, I wanna figure out how Joanna fits into all this. So um, could you, Joanna and Kira, if you wanna chime in, but go in, um, could you tell us, Joanna, a little bit about the process of, um, of coming on board this project? Like, what at what point did you come on board? And then as an executive producer, what do you want to be in place before you come on board? And what do you expect to bring to a project? Oh, wait, you're on mute, you're on mute. All your gems and genius are going out. <laughs> I gave them all already. <laughs> um, well, so on, on Love Seat, we came on board as, as a tech sponsor. Um, and so we, we offered up technology, you know, uh, both the, the, the hardware as well as any technical consulting or software, uh, you know, in terms of what, what was needed and how to, how to make it all work. Um, and we really enjoyed the experience, really were, we were very impressed by what had been built. Um, and similar with, with running, you know, we, we offered some, some technology support. Um, on this project, I'm trying to think where, Kara, you probably know better than, like, well, like where you were in the whole journey as it, when we started talking about what, um, you know, us coming in. I think, was it in the beginning of the year, maybe, or the, the fall or the winter? I mean, the whole year ran together. <laughs> right? I know, I don't know if I can pinpoint the month anymore. I'm sure there's an email exchange with a pitch deck. I mean, I know we'd, I mean, Alyssa and I had done two pitch decks, you know, we had a very, significant one for the Pandora production. And then as the pandemic hit and we were pivoting and Culture Hub said, just put something else together, we had an outline for what that version would be. Um, and that was a kind of experiment. And I think it just started with like, uh, we need a headset to support an actor. Like, let's just start there. And then things just kind of kept growing as Culture Hub was behind us. And they said, you know, okay, we can give you a little bit of funding so you can get through these experiments in digital storytelling, which gave us enough to just kind of I'll rehearse a little bit and put something really raw out to the world. So if anyone finds those live streams, you'll see 
us putting a lot of risky ideas out there. And I think, you know, publicly um, playing with things that work and publicly also playing with things that don't work and seeing yeah. how we could take that physical and virtual format that we really wanted to do and make it now a, a totally virtual format. Yeah, so I think, I think we came in probably a little over a year ago. Okay. I want to say um, maybe even maybe even earlier than that, and and so our you know it started with tech you know techno coming in again with technology with with, with, with some financial support, um, and and then you know what we built out as how we wanted to participate was to support and you know support the overall project in in those ways, but also um, you know getting more eyes on it, helping with. With, with press, helping with reach, helping with this uh, business model and, and modeling out different scenarios and what, what might work, what might not work, thinking about you know where, where we would go. Um, so those are the, those are some of the things that we help with. And in terms of kind of you know how we think about projects, we want we want to make sure that we're working with a project that where our technology is is critical to the project and um, you know it, it show, showcases the technology in a really positive way. That the values of the, the the storytellers as well as the story is aligned with our our values as a company. And so here are some of the values are around around hope around optimism, around connection, around community, and then also around inclusion. And so those are all values that are very important to us as a company and, you know, and, and very important to us on our, on our virtual reality team. Amazing. And so it's all, all of that aligned. And, and, and also the projects where we, where are, we, are, we can make a, a difference to the project, you know, where the, our contribution, whether it be through technology or through financial or through additional, um, you know, advice and strategy and building out can, can positively impact the overall, the overall project. Fantastic. Um, no, it must be so wonderful for them to have you on board. Not only do you have the, the business, marketing, and tech expertise, but you have a background in entertainment. Um, so you're really kind of the perfect fit, even outside of just the, a the HP angle of it, which is really yeah, cool. And, to see. and it's really fun. It's really fun for us. You know, like as you said, I, I come from an entertainment background, so it's nice to um, you know, and that's that is like my my deepest passion with this with this um, it, industry is like what amazing stories and experiences are we building for people then that, that live on top of or in you know in in support of and and together with the technology yeah awesome um, so i'm going to i'm going to tease again we're going to get we're going to get to Vaughn and he's going to give you a secret a secret special something that I'm not going to spoil just yet. But before we do, I just wanted to give Mark a minute to talk about his role in that process of, you know, sort of coming on early while the project is still being built and providing them that that stage, right? The Mount Olympus, a mountain and, and, and grass. Um, and then, you know, how did you engage with everyone? Were you, you know, were you there? in all the rehearsals with, you know, communicating with the actors as well? Or was it was Kira sort of the the you know the brain for the whole thing that would you know communicate with the different branches of creatives like and and how was your technical process affected by this free-flowing rehearsal process yeah so um Kira definitely is the brain for the whole thing but we <laughs> we were as a tech team quite often in the rehearsals just to see how things were working out um because there's a lot of I guess you would call it playtesting, right? Because it's playtesting not only for the users, but also for our cast. Our cast are using tools frequently that we're making for them. So we have to make sure that they work correctly. And, and we can see issues sometimes, you know, like we want Kira to focus on, you know, the things that she needs to focus on. So it alleviates her sometimes if we're in there as well to sort of see how things are working out. Um, we were lucky enough to be involved very early on in the process and um, that allows us as the tech team to say like, oh, here's this thing that you're coming up with in the script, you know, Alyssa and Kira are working on the script. And it's like, you know, this is, um, here's an element that will, you know, puzzle or something that will drive the story forward. And we'll sort of negotiate with them and be like, okay, here's what you want. And like, here's how we're talking, you know, here's how we imagine as a tech team going to pull that off, right? So it's like, you know, it's each of these puzzles is unique and each of them has to be made in such a way that um, we like to compare it to escape rooms. Um, and one of the things that I like about escape rooms is escape rooms, once you figure out the puzzle, it's not hard anymore. None of the tools are complicated. And that's the thing here with ours is, you know, we have people that are brand new to VR. Like we've had 
people that literally said they unboxed their headset the night before. And in those sort of cases, we need to make an experience that, you know, experienced uh, gamers or VR gamers are used to um, and find rewarding. Um, but by the same token, finds, you know, make experiences that even, you know, people that are brand new can also engage in and find fulfilling. So it's, it was sort of that balance of let's make really unique and interesting things for the cast members to do, especially in these split elements where they go to Futurist City and the Underworld, um, but also stuff that they, like, they're not struggling to figure out because, again, we have, like, a time element, right? We have to reconverge the story at the end. Um, so it's, it was a lot of, like, back and forth and, you know, removing friction, uh, especially from things that didn't end up working very well. Just because, like, you know, again, like, there's parts of the process. And that's what was so useful about bringing Vaughn onto the team is his intimate familiarity with VR chat specifically. Because there's nothing I can say that's more important than actually knowing the platform. The platform will provide you your possibilities and limitations for what you can do in the show. Amazing. Well, that seems like an introduction so good, I couldn't have set it up better myself. <laughs> I don't know if I, Vaughn, do you want to take it away? Or Sarah, would you like to introduce? The, the next section of our uh, our program. Yeah, so sure. we are so excited uh, to have an exclusive feature for ReConnect. Vaughn so graciously offered uh, to give us a tour of uh, the space, a world tour of this uh, virtual space. We are so excited to see it. Vaughn, you can take it away. Thank you. What? Right. Yeah. See you. It's a great shirt. OK. Uh, Turns out the button was a lie. Uh, host is able to dispensary <laughs> sharing. So Vaughn bon, uh, bon will do a screen share, um, and I'm going to help narrate and kind of guide us through. Um, and then it, I'll make this pretty collaborative and also encourage other members of our team to pepper in some stories. So, But first, we'll get uh, Vaughn's ability to screen share when we know that that magical ability has been granted to him and we'll bring a view of the world in from Mount Olympus and we'll kind of take you guys through for anyone that hasn't been into our story world. Is that right? Yes, brilliant. Right. So this is the cloud lobby. <laughs> <laughs> so Vaughn's gonna kind of navigate through and we'll probably notice you know, a little bit of stuttering and latency and all of the wonderful things that come with working in the digital arts. Um, but this is where the audience begins. And so there's some chairs you can see. We actually, we learned that we have to teach them how to sit. Um, that's something that we didn't think uh, would be totally necessary. We'd, we'd built a pretty detailed onboarding. So, so there Vaughn is sitting for us. Um, and Vaughn, if you want to just tilt down for a second, just leave your camera showing your Greek chorus avatar, um, I think we can see the kind of body. See how you have hands there? So the whole audience gets to embody this Greek chorus avatar. We give them this avatar to wear. Like Eva was saying, it's like putting on here, their- I have it here. I have it in my-, in my Costume um, and toga. Oh yes, and you can also see on, uh, on Joanna's screen, the pop out of her fully embodied. So when you get to look down in the experience, you know, these are your hands, this is, this is your body, you, you start to identify with this role and that's something that's really important to us. Um, Alyssa has worked very hard on all of these uh, really clear onboarding placards that we have, which we've also seen a number of our colleagues um, uh, also kind of replicate in their productions because I think we're finding that as we build experiences in Altspace or VR chat and on other platforms, they're or specific things that is helpful to do, but if you're new to the platform, you might not how, know how to do these things. And even if you are an old hat at the platform, you also might not know how to do these things. So we teach you a little bit about kind of using your menus to encourage a better experience. We remind you how to mute. So like, as you see, like, is a dog barking or do you need to sneeze? These are things that we wouldn't normally have to do in the theater. We have to be mindful of that. You know, you don't answer your cell phone in the theater. You are reminded sometimes in, a, in an early message not to open a wrapper. Um, and so we're reminding people of those things too, because you kind of forget about this in the virtual world. So, you know, you might have a construction site. Um, you might have a, a really loud computer that's humming right next to your headset. And you just have to be mindful because we do want the audience to engage and talk 
in different key moments. So Iris and Hermes um, greet you in the cloud lobby and it's this really fun interactive. I mean, we're so lucky to have these actors, Jen Harris, Hilary Walker, Sarah Finn and Lisa Drang, who take you through this scene um, and engage with you with so much energy and heart. And so Vaughn, if you wanna kind of pivot over towards the Greek chorus avatar, we could show there's a changing pedestal that we have. Um, so we get you into costume over there. Um, and that's how you get to start to take your role on in the production. Um, and then let's let's march through perhaps the cloud gate into the opening sacred fire. And just, just FYI, the frame rate is much higher when you're in the experience. Uh, uh, I, people would be violently. I, I'm roughly seven miles from the nearest paved road, so my upload speed isn't great. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll just we'll we'll kind of drive through a little bit and then maybe we'll pause so why don't you just give us a pause right here Vaughn this is a great angle right. so we see this um sacred fire here on our left in the screen and so this is um you know we'd like to build in as many three-dimensional tools when we're making our productions as we can so this fire was made in tilt brush um and this was done by our artist Sarah Finn who works in the VR industry um, the lighting, uh, what's pretty magical about all this lighting that you see in the environment, which is, was designed by theatrical and VR designer, Beth Cates. She works in both theater. She's a background in physical theater production, as well as a master's uh, working in VR and computer science. So we are really grateful to have her brain on our team and she's really lit the whole world. It really came to life. Um, then you see we have all this graffiti, these messages that are kind of reminding us, uh, giving us a little bit of a modern flavor, what the mortal realm has been leaving as they break into these worlds. And they're pretty much all these messages are saying things like, uh, die Apollo, you know, and, and like no gods, like we don't believe in these gods anymore because the mortal realm is frustrated and, and of course they don't have hope. And so Vaughn, why don't you take us slowly and, and we'll stop when we get into the light forest and we can take a pause there and talk about what happens in the light forest. So as we are approaching the light forest, this is exactly what the Greek chorus gets to do in the production. They um, they teleport, so they're learning how to use their locomotion. They're, we're definitely walking through this space. So some people like to compare us to um, Punch Drunk and Sleep No More sometimes because it is really active. Um, and that's a really great view, Vaughn. I love that. That's a, it's a really great example. So again, this light forest was created in Tilt Brush by Sarah Finn. Um, you might see um, rotating around these pillars of light are the names of these gods. And maybe Alyssa, you want to share one of the stories that gets shared, perhaps. Uh, Vaughn, do you want to pick Apollo or Athena? Alyssa, do you, do you want to share sure. one of the messages from them? <laughs> so at, at this point, we, we ask the audience to, um, you know, if, if hope returns to the world, what would they wish for? And we talk about they're going, they're going to go on a quest, like the great heroes, like Hercules and Theseus and Jason. And, and, um, and so we ask them to think of a wish, think of something that they would wish for if, if hope returned and they could go out again and pick a flower and offer that flower to the gods. And then Corey, who's our Greek chorus leader will give them a prediction. So I see Vaughn that you have chosen Apollo, Apollo who is the god of poetry and sunlight and all sorts of wonderful things. And and I predict Vaughn that when this confinement is over and COVID is a dim memory, your life will be full of sunshine and poetry. So what gets to happen is for each chorus member, they pick a god. Um, and I don't know Vaughn if you can click and even drop it or if you want to click some of these flowers and drop and kind of show the magical, we have a little fun magical surprise that happens when you pick your god and you drop it in the light pillar. Um, there's a really kind of beautiful magic moment that happens. So, and then uh, Corey um, gets to as many in the Greek chorus as she can. She doesn't get to everybody, but she tries to share these kind of uh, special prophecies with you, depending on the god that you picked. So uh, so that's our moment in the light forest. And this really grew out of a COVID moment, actually. Lisa and I had come up with a number of ideas. The idea was, at one point, I think we were even talking about actually dedicating pillars of light to people that had passed from COVID. Like we would have the audience 
contribute names that we were going to dedicate pillars of light. And then that we were like, that's a little morbid. <laughs> it's not, we want this to be hopeful and not sad. Exactly. Uh, and also just to be a lot of work on the dev team. Like, you know, we'd be updating the project all the time based on submissions. So what we actually did in digital experiments and digital storytelling is we had people dedicate, um, they could pick like pictures of things, of images. Um, and I feel like that was like an early kernel that led to this moment of the building of the light forest. And then we chose, we'll keep it in the frame of the narrative. We won't make this all about the mortals here, but you know, this will be about the gods that have disappeared. So Vaughn, why don't you take us to the entrance that we start to pass through. Corey leads us out and I'll have you pause and maybe we can even get you close enough and then have you pull up a lighting cue. Um, this is Corey's staff, it's left for her here. But so why don't you just pause for a moment and can you bring up lighting cue one? Mm -hmm. So this is an animated lighting cue. I mean, probably it's so subtle for the audience, like they're just kind of marching through, but there's all of these amazing lighting cues that come on during the production that Beth Cates has designed and SB Proctor, our sound designer. We have all these live sound cues that happen in the production. So I would, I feel like they, pro like the audience, it's so like, they might not even know that we're kind of wrapping all of these live moments around them. Um, but just like a theater, a theater production would have, we have all of these really beautiful lighting design moments. Um, and so, so that's lighting cue one. So you guys get to see it really carefully because probably if you saw the show, you just fly through it and you might not even pay attention. But now you know, if you leave the light forest and you enter towards the main stage field, um, that is something that, that subtly pops up. Um, could I just interject something here, which yeah. is that this is something that probably a lot of people even who have done the experience are not aware of, which is that we're all on uh, the whole um, crew actually is on discord behind the scenes and that in Venice, Kira was calling all of the cues. So this is actually working like live theater. We have a stage manager who gives the actors their cues. Um, when they're about to come on, and Kira was calling the lights and audio cues. Well, so MC, it, MC, we'll, I'll and get, MC, gonna, MC called yes. the light cues, but yes, I did, oh, yeah. I did bring them up. I ran the board, which was a crazy idea, um, uh, but I did run the board, and fortunately now we have Vaughn running our board, which has been such a gift to us. I'll just chime in on, on that as well, but as a performer, uh, it means that um, you know, I've got my, my earbuds here and I've got one set of earbuds that is in the world so I can hear everybody talking in the world. And I've got a whole, I've got a, actually a Bluetooth headphone in the other ear that is tapped into the discord channel so that I can hear if anything's going wrong or when my next cue is from the stage manager. Um, and so that's a, that's an interesting, uh, experience. And, and actually one thing I'll, I'll share from our very first experiment where um, half the audience was in world, uh, in VR headset in world with me. And the other uh, part of the audience was streaming. And so they were watching on, uh, like I think YouTube was the, the streaming platform that we were using. Um, but I knew that there were cameras, virtual cameras in the space that Kira was calling between. And because I had this other earbud in, I could hear Kira calling all of those cues. And so I knew where the camera was at any given moment. And so as a performer, I'm not only thinking about how the audience that's around me is perceiving me, but I'm also thinking about where is that camera right now to make sure that I'm including that streaming audience at the at the same time and kind of uh, almost having two different conversations at the same time. Just uh, uh, is both overwhelming and actually very very exciting as a performer to to juggle. A lot of information. So for any actors or anyone that's working with actors. It's pretty technical, but I think, you know, when you work with really intelligent actors, they can handle, you can keep throwing things at them. They can handle multiple audio streams and, and learning and like knowing all about these technical cues. And it makes for a really great team effort. Like we're all in this together. We know that things will break down. We have to be able to, you know, make each other aware. And like, you know, I remember in one of the last shows that we did during South by Southwest, Jonathan was moving from, he just transitioned. We bring the audience through these portals 
and and all kinds of things can go haywire. You know, I don't know how many of you, you know, transport yourselves through portals on a regular basis, uh, but in the virtual world, right? Um, we lose people sometimes, uh, wonder, wonderful surprises happen. Jonathan, and this had never happened before, every show there's a new thing that we learn that's never happened before that we've never encountered. So I think our like technical diagram list is just growing. I don't know how, um, Mark and Chris Tapino are doing and documenting all of these wonderful technical things that we navigate through every time, but I think our list just must be like 20 pages long at this point. And the audience loaded in without John or Jonathan loaded in first, and then the audience wasn't there for a long time. So he went back to Mount Olympus to get them, and then the audience arrived and there was like nothing he could do. And I just watched. I'm watching this from backstage and I'm like, how are they, are they going to figure this out? Because can they actually break through this first puzzle without having any information from him and any of the kind of dialogue prompts that Alyssa's has written for him? And it was just really, really fascinating to see them kind of try to figure things out. And then Jonathan come back and have to improvise at the top of that scene because all of these weird technical things that happened that we didn't expect. So um, we're definitely riding by the seat of our pants in every yeah performance and those pro provide actually really happy accidents where you learn something so you know coming in late there's actually a narrative opportunity there where you know we've set up that the gods are are in risk of disappearing and the world you know their world falling apart if they don't get help and so me coming in late it just seems to be like i can just you know improvise that as part of what's going on in that moment and I love, you know, like the fact that uh, taking account of those happy accidents uh, is something that not only the performers the, on the narrative side, but also on the on the developer side, we're kind of tracking all of that vocabulary so that we're always learning from those uh, those mistakes. So I, I should mention I, I teach a class uh, at University of Maryland on augmented reality design, and uh, sp specifically for experiential um, uh, uh, augmented reality. And I'm constantly telling the students like, oh good, you, you found a new way that, that the experience went wrong, that it went haywire. Those are great. All of those failures, those are totally your, your friends. And you know, those are the things to get excited about when you run into and then see how you troubleshoot those. Um, but I think also with the Discord and like our team behind the scenes, we've gotten really good at um, sort of <laughs> hiding some of those. So quite often people will be like, oh, we thought you meant to do that. And it's like, you, we thought that was just part of the show. So. You know, you know. Also, credit to our actors for very good improving. But um, you know, we we're fortunate that you know everyone on the team is ready to solve problems immediately and sort of understands the platform enough that like we can resolve issues quite often, like very fast as they happen. Especially with audience members, because quite often audience members themselves have their own unique issues. So we may find ways to get people in there to help them secretly while like everyone else is kind of watching the show. My favorite instance of that issue was actually one uh, recently where Jonathan was supposed to be using a like a key prop in the scene. And we just kind of all watched that prop float off into the distance very slowly. So uh, Jonathan had to quickly uh, come up with a different prop to use instead and it, it all went pretty well. So <laughs> yeah, and it's also a place where, you know, the fact that I have a, a, a somewhat of a technical understanding about this world because I spent time in it and had conversations with Mark, with Vaughn, Kira, um, so that I, I, you know, not only sort of narratively, but technically understand how the world works. So when something like that happens, I know what's going on. And that actually means that I can spend less time as an actor going, wait, what's happening right now? And go, ah, okay, that, that weird, you know, technical thing that happens with physics and VR chat's happening. And so now I can weave that into my story. Um, and you know those as the as the crew uh, often gets us credit for its performance, which is is really lovely. That we've we've learned to be our own technical troubleshooting um, support staff uh, with this, which is I think part of the the for me a really great um, challenge to engage with working remotely. With Lovesea, we had you know a, a technical person there who's dedicated just for us in case our computer crashed or a headset went out. Uh, during the live performance and so you know this year it's been us as performers going oh um my frame rate is you know too low for this to work right now i know how to refresh my headset or my audio is not working i know some ways that i can troubleshoot this or I, if i can't solve it i know how to talk to mark or, or somebody else on, on the dev team and say 
here's what's going on, here's where I'm stuck, and that really can help them to help me solve a problem I can't solve myself. That's been an exciting thing for us, where we're definitely, we had these dedicated technicians in the production of Love Seed, and now I feel like we can say that the actors are empowered to become their own technologists, so they're each running their own little HP setup of all of their hardware themselves. So, okay, Vaughn, why don't you take us through towards the field where we encounter scene one. So all of these scenes have been this kind of pre-show uh, moments that we've written. And then really scene one happens through here and you'll see a mix of 3D modeling and a mix of tilt brush. Um, and let's just pause right there, that's great. Um, and could you in fact bring up lighting Q2? A slow transition. But. It's a very slow one. So what you start to see is the lighting starting to grow. So as the audience gathers and the audience really travels further, but I want you guys to have a kind of full picture of the world so you can see Mount Olympus and how grand the scale is. I remember when we brought in some of our designers, I remember SB her first time, our sound designer, kind of at the gate of the world, just going like, it's. she just said to me, it's much bigger than I thought. And you just don't get the sense of the scale until you're in there in VR. So this world is quite massive. And um, we've been playing with some different things. We played with something during South By where Zeus started to play a game with some of the Greek chorus members with um, at the table because of course all the gods have disappeared. Um, so he, so he, he's, you know, he's disillusioned and he's having these lengthy conversations with them, but they're not really there. Um, and then we played with some other things. Corey brings the chorus up. They have a line that they've rehearsed with her that they get to sing in this scene. And so we don't want to give too much away here, but Jonathan, do you want to talk about any, any fun memories for you of, um, as you get to sort of change costumes in, in scene one or as the chorus comes to greet you, anything here you want to share with us? Um, yeah, I think that there's one of the things that's uh, incredible about creating work and performing work that's in VR is that um, you're able to play with scale um, in some really unique ways. And I think it's, you know, one of these things to keep in mind, like what is, what is, what is something that VR does really well? It plays with scale really well. And that changes our perception of uh, what's happening around us, how we kind of interpret events, but also how we interpret characters. So the fact that Zeus, uh, that avatar is a good deal taller than any of the other avatars that are in the space that, that we, you know, that, you know, gives some, um, gives something to the character, right? We sort of understand that he's got stature because um, we literally can em embody him with it. And um, there's different places where Zeus can, you know, I can change my avatar and we've kind of set up some different places for me to, to do that in those first scenes. And um, one of those avatars gets really, really huge. Um, and that's something that, you know, you couldn't embody in the same way if you're doing it as a live performance. Um, uh, and it's, it's really fun to kind of play with that with the audience, because my relationship to them uh, can instantaneously change. And, um, and there's some fun to be had. And one of the things that's great about live performance is that every time you get to try it slightly different and see how the audience reacts slightly different with each of those moments. Um, and even in VR where you can't see facial expressions on, on the audience members, uh, I've kind of learned how to read their avatar body language and see how something's landing on them. See if you know I need them to look in a certain direction at a certain moment, whether with my body language and, and with my voice, I can help direct them to that, that uh, area in the scene that's most important for them to look at. So Vaughn, I don't know that we'll uh, get through all the other beats that we've talked about, but maybe where we want to end is just if you want to take us up the dock, um, since we have Jonathan here with us, so we could just sort of take, so there's a boat over here um, that Jonathan gets to take half the audience to, to go to the underworld, and we won't go in the boat necessarily but we'll just kind of give you guys a pretty view of what this half of the audience gets to journey onto it's really fun i think one of my favorite things is because this moment can be improvised and it takes 
everyone a minute to kind of figure out how to sit in VR. It's not a normal thing sitting. So um, so we get to uh, experience this. Um, and maybe, Vaughn, if you can just show us where we're going. Yeah, if you guys see that kind of really cool nebula, this is this kind of um, spot that we that we take the boat ride to, um, and then everyone goes through a portal to get to the underworld. Uh, but one of my favorite moments that I've now heard a number of audiences is, is to sing, row, row, row your boat with them on the way. <laughs> and it's been absolutely adorable and cheerful and like the whole audience gets so into it. So I don't know if that's happened to you every time, but it's been fun as some audiences engage with you that there. Yeah, that was a, a moment where you know, there wasn't something specific scripted in during this whole journey that takes, I don't know, 45 seconds to a minute or so to complete. And so it seemed like there was an opportunity to have some fun and engage in the audience in, in some way. And so um, I think kind of early on, I sort of hit on this uh, sort of play on the, you know, song Row, Row Your Boat, and Zeus has come up with his own little lyrical change for it. And what's fun is that without prompting at all, the audience decides to sing along, and which is actually really kind of incredible because um, trying to get anybody, uh, trying to get a group of people to do something in unison in VR is notoriously difficult. And so oftentimes it will keep people from wanting to do something all at the same time. And uh, we've you know, created a world where people feel okay to uh, all jump in and, and, and to vocally do something together. Um, and uh, and that's that's uh, yeah, that's actually pretty pretty remarkable in VR. It's been really playful. So I think Vaughn, if you want to stop sharing your screen here, um, we won't go to the last beat. We won't need to get there. I think so. We can hand the mic back over to Eve as we manage to pull off this little world tour um, with whatever frame rate. But hopefully that gave gave everyone a little bit of a glimpse into into the story world of Mount Olympus, our main stage, and we won't show you the other two quest adventures. We have to save something to surprise you guys. So when you come back to the show, you can actually see something fun. Uh, but that at least gives you an idea of, of the bulk of the scenes take place in this main stage environment. Well, that makes me want to ask a question, Kira, and I don't know if you know the answer yet, but do you know yet when people will get to see it? Like when there will be more shows and we can all jump back in or in for the first time? Great question, Eve. We're working on that. Um, we definitely yeah. were, we are aligning actor and tech team schedules. We're trying to figure out, you know, what is the right price point? What would people want to pay for this? Because um, we can't just run the show totally for free. Um, so to kind of figure out what's an know, audience survey for that question. Yes, right. If anyone wants to comment here <laughs> also um, <laughs> on what they think the price point should be, we're, we're open. Um, but it's it's definitely a hefty, you know, it's a it's a good size commitment for us on our side. You know, we log in an hour before the show. We provide audience support, um, and then on top of it, we you know our actors are coming from Broadway and real professional theater, and they give it their all, and they're singing and they're improvising with you, and there's there's a lot of energy. It's a full it's a full effort. It takes a village. <laughs> We have one vote for $25. Sold. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Sarah, I don't know if you wanted to explain how the Q&A works or if, if I should, in terms of like how we want uh, folks out there in the, the audience to, to let us know what they want to ask. Um, my yeah. sense is it's putting it in the, in the Q&A chat. So if you go to the bottom of your menu, you'll see Q&A if you click on that. Uh, you should be able to type in a question, um, and then I will pass that along to our panelists. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Please engage in the Q&A. Thank you so much for this tour, and we welcome any feedback, comments, as well as questions. What do you think? Uh, we'd love to hear in the chat. Well, while we're waiting for some questions to come in, if, if you don't mind me, I had some extra questions that we didn't even get to before. Um, since we, we were just talking a little bit about this idea of getting the show out to a broader audience, I'm curious if you guys would be willing to share a little bit about the process of getting it seen, both by festival teams and by real people. 
um, you know, having this great idea and an amazing talent and a show is one thing, <laughs> but it's a whole other thing to get people on. And you guys did it even earlier than the festivals. You had sort of, it sounded like you had sort of test audiences coming in to help you refine it. So um, I'd be super curious to know about that process, you know, at each of those stages. For experiments in digital storytelling, we had uh, the kind of split structure that we've been doing in the physical and virtual world. So we did it instead of the physical world as we could not gather there anymore. We had the digital world gathering online and we did these camera views out from the virtual world and we also had a virtual audience. And that was a lot to coordinate. We wanna get back to that structure, but I think our team needs to be double the size of what it is because we're basically handling two audiences simultaneously and they have very different needs. They have to go and see things um, creatively like, and it has to be very carefully structured for them. Um, and I remember uh, in some of that footage, uh, we'd had um, Mark and Chris DePino as our virtual cinematographers and we'd had done some camera blocking and rehearsed with them with the actors. And then our audience just went and stood right in front of their cameras. Um, and I tried to flip their blocking live to be like, okay, camera B go here and camera A go here. Um, and then an audience stepped in front of the, the other camera. So it was like nothing, uh, it was like trying to control chaos, which again, I think is you know, sort of why we're in this. We love the live challenge. We want this to be live, but it comes with a lot of unexpected surprises. So we're just navigating those things. And yes, we definitely had some beta audiences come through. Um, and then as we- where do, you, uh, where do you get your beta audiences from? It's a great question. I think they come, you know, they're, they're people that have headsets. Okay. So they're not total newbies, um, but we definitely brought people in that were new to the VR chat platform so we could test with them about what it would be like to get through some of those early onboarding beats and, and ha was there enough onboarding for them? Um, and it's a real Herculean effort to get every audience member in. There's definitely some layers of, and especially for those that get a headset, we certainly have met people that come to the festivals that tell us, you know, they bought a headset in order to watch our show. Um, they're absolutely new to VR entirely. So like just charging their headset and, and um, you know, putting batteries in their controllers is all new for them. So we, we also try to help them and hold their hand a bit. And that's why we provide a full hour of audience support on a Discord channel before the production even begins. Amazing. And so, I mean, that, so that's a Herculean achievement, but then getting it seen by festival folks, like that must be a whole other one. You're in different places. They may or may not have headsets. Like, how do you, how do you bridge that gap? Because one of the things, you know, I know what you're dealing with is, is you have this amazing vision and, and you've brought it to life, but trying to convey it to a programmer without them having seen it with some sort of a trailer or a write-up is, I mean, it's, it's impossible sort of in a way, like how did you guys uh, deal? Clearly you've been great at it, so kudos to you, but how did you, uh, you know, overcome that challenge? So I'm, I'm typically, and this is, you know, for better or for worse, I'm kind of not afraid to show people my work before it's finished, which is not really normal in the film industry. And as of when I made cinema, you know, and, and 2D formatted films, I would never show something to someone that hadn't been through, like if, if it was a test audience, they were filling out questionnaires. I mean, if it was a rough cut, but it had still gone through many forms of editing. These days, as I work in VR, and it's something that I've blogged a little bit about, I find that I'm just sort of going, it's so early days, I don't really care. I know things are not gonna work. So it's possible that, um, you know, critics in the environment might say, oh, this isn't, this is not fully developed here and this was broken, but I know that. And I'm just saying, that's okay, we're experimenting. And the only way I think that we move, that we push the needle forward as an industry is if we break things together and we, and we experiment. So I, you know, I brought programmers in, um, they had headsets. They certainly, any, any of the VR programmers at the festivals did have access to a headset. Um, and, and I'd sent them story decks and the script and pictures and a whole stack of materials. Um, but in order to, you know, send them more than just a 2D video clip, because it is immersive, I would bring them into the world if I didn't have actors. So I'd bring them in and kind of show them around and show them how some of the mechanics and things worked and talk through story beats. And then as soon as we had actors performing, whether it was a rehearsal or we had, um, you know, like a special event that we were performing, I would try to get them there 
which is always tricky because they are very busy and we're usually running very limited amounts of shows. So um, coordinating all those pieces is, is, also, uh, is also a challenge. Yeah, <laughs> it really is. <laughs> this is amazing. Um, every part of this is an amazing feat that you guys have pulled off. Um, one of our questions from our panelists is that uh, he's writing that he's an actor in Iran and um, that is saying that the space of theater in his country is full of censors and limiting for free work. What might your advice be uh, for an actor like him in that sort of space? Well, I would hope that these virtual spaces provide a lot of freedom, that we don't have the kinds of barriers that we might have by going to a physical venue. Like, probably it's got to be, it's, it's might be tricky to record something and post something, but I wonder if, you know, at least by finding people you want to rehearse and perform with and create with, kind of finding other, other creatives out there that you want to work with, you might be able to do more than you might not be able to do um, in, a, in a physical location that might have other barriers. Anyone else want to chime in on thoughts for that? I was just going to say that this is one of the unexpected silver linings of the phase that we've all been through with COVID is that remote connections have become so prevalent and so easy. Um, so I know that you're in a, in a country where um, where it's not as simple as it is in the in the West, clearly. Um, but you can be acting from anywhere in the world and you can find team members and other people interested in VR theater anywhere in the world. Um, that said, you know, I don't know if you have access to headsets. I don't know how your internet connection works. You know, it's easy for, for us to say these things. Um, but I would say, you know, if you can, reach out to other people who are involved in theater, reach out to other people who are involved in VR. The, that, that virtual connection is an incredibly rich resource that has really become developed over the past year. Yeah, and just along with that, I mean, I would, I would definitely say that um, be aware of, you know, I don't know how, like, like Alyssa was saying, I don't know how your internet works. If you typically have to use VPNs and stuff. Um, this VR chat, the platform that we use may be prohibited. Um, and so you would have to find a way to sort of connect with other people if that's the case uh, in order to put on something like this. Um, that being said, if you can use those platforms, I would explore the platforms and then consider making your own show because the great thing about VR chat, yeah, is that you're, you can be anonymous if you choose to be. Um, there's unique communities for all sorts of people uh, on VR chat. Um, and uh, yeah, there's people that are looking to do this sort of stuff. I dropped a, a link for a project that was was at Sundance this year that that um, was about a, a ex ex experience in Iran. So you might want to check out that project. They didn't use VR; they used other uh, other three hundred and sixty mediums. So they used they used U YouTube video, live video, as well as Instagram. Um, but it's an, an interesting project, and maybe some some other people that you might want to connect with that worked on that project to to understand a little bit more about what they did and how. Just to chime in really quickly, also I think Joanna brings up a good point, which is that um, you, there are lots of different digital mediums that are available to collaborate on, and um, you know, th so the the barrier to to entry to just kind of uh, getting in some kind of um, immersive space to be able to explore what what that space might have in terms of storytelling and how to. Uh, collaborate and communicate with um, other people from other parts of, of the world um, it is, is uh, I think, more possible now than ever before. And there's more people from across the world that are in those different spaces, um, in those social spaces to start conversations. Um, and just like, you know, our team, you know, we had to kind of go into VR chat to see what we could make. Um, I think there's that possibility uh, for any platform. People are making things on an audio platform like Clubhouse or um, you know, creating shows via Zoom. And there's a lot of great work that's happening at this festival from people who are just getting really creative with um, how to uh, see what's out there and just available at, to hand, really, and make something from, from that. I think you know, live performance makers, that's one of the things that we're always 
we're always good at, whether it's an empty space and you know we're using what's there in the empty space or whether that's in sort of the digital space. Great. Um, and we have a couple more questions that have come in while you guys were giving that amazing answer. Um, when you discuss new projects and themes to develop, how much do you consider or give weight to knowing the technology that can enable your vision? So how is the conversation about technology at the development stage? What is, what is that? Well, all I can say is Kira has is one of the most visionary people that I have ever worked with. And um, often her creative vision comes first and then it's up to all of us, but most specifically Mark, uh, to figure out how to do it. Um, so I would say that the creative in, in terms of Kira often comes first, but she also has a vast knowledge of technology and also has the amazing ability to imagine using existing technology in new ways and then it's over to mark like and he has to accomplish the impossible to make her vision come true that would that would be my response to that one awesome That's very it. kind Alyssa. you're also brilliantly creative um yes uh and someone's asking us literally about getting the tilt brush in so i was like there must be tilt brush in this environment and then mark had to figure it out <laughs> Yeah, no, it, 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 it works out, though, because um, when we collaborate with each other, sort of like working through like, oh, you know, there was a specific puzzle I'm thinking of in Future City where it was like, you guys had an original vision for it. And I said, here's something similar that we could do that would, you know, be far simpler and, you know, wouldn't have to like, you know, go nuts trying to uh, figure out how to get it to work. So it, it is like a, there is some negotiable element to it where it's like you have to collaborate with the team to say like, what, what can we do that sort of gets the gist, gets the thought, the, the original thought that the narrative team had across, uh, but is still manageable for us on the development side for, cause, you know, there's limitations, um, you know, not only like, you know, there's limitations with VR chat, there's limitations of what people will be able to accomplish as new users. There's a lot of things to consider when you're building um, these elements into the story. Okay, um, our next question is, do you think users' avatars could be used as a tool to create identification with their own characters, like in role-playing? I, I do, yeah. I think that there's, that there's a lot of possibility for, for your avatars and, like the, and, and filling out much deeper narratives. Um, and there's something that we've been toying about with Jonathan actually about developing a variety show. Uh, we keep getting really busy, um, but we've been talking about the idea of Zeus kind of hosting this variety show with other, with these gods and goddesses and using our backdrop again as a location. We really treat Mount Olympus as a location where we can do other things. We could, we could run other productions and we could also host live events like we've done with IndieWire and like we'll be doing with HP in the future. So uh, we really like to look at this story world that we've bit at, built as a location and, and venue. And I think the same goes through with the avatar is that, that we can embrace the avatar and make that part of the character's identity. And that can continue on in a vast metaverse with a lot of infinite possibilities. Amazing. And I think that that was part of, of your vision, too, for um, finding Pandora X, Kira, if I could speak for you for a moment, in the development of the uh, Greek corpse avatar that you did with Rhea, was to have an avatar that was um, sort of gender neutral. It could be worn by anyone, but in putting on that avatar, that costume, um, everyone identifies as a member of the Greek chorus. So I think that that's an example of a, a very effective way of, of using an avatar to have people identify with a character, with their own characters. It's true, and we talked a lot about skin color too. You know, there was a moment when um, an early design team, at, and this was just, you know, sort of by choice, had by like by default that we started to make the gods, you know, uh, human skin colors. And then we said as a team, there's something else we can play with. And I, and I spoke with Rhea, who's this wonderful artist that's been, that's become our lead character designer. And, and we talked about, you know, why do the gods have to be human colors? They could be any color of the rainbow. And so let's embrace that. 
and say gods don't have to be um, what we might typically associate in, in the default version of our brains. Let's play with bias. Let's play with these other things and, and push boundaries. And so our Greek chorus is gray and I think they're beautiful and they sparkle when they catch the light. And many of our audience members continue to wear their Greek chorus avatar into other parts of the metaverse. It's kind of the souvenir that we give you for coming to the show. You get to take this avatar with you out and save it. Hmm. People, you probably do get more use out of your Greek chorus avatar than you do from your sleep no more mask with the long nose. <laughs> um, amazing. So Sarah, I know we've, we've come upon two o'clock. There are a couple more uh, questions in the chat. Do we want, how, do we have time for any more? Do we have time for one final question? Do we have time for a, you know, three more? What's, where are we at in terms of timing? take one more question maybe from someone in the Q&A who um, their question hasn't been answered. I'll, I'll let you, Eve, if you find a good one you want to submit. Thank you all for your questions. These are um, really great. Okay, so this is a little bit, um, I'm torn between two of them, but I'll <laughs> but because we haven't talked about this yet, I'll, I'll ask this one. Um, from a practical standpoint, budgeting for a production of this size, what is your budget range? Do you have a larger contingency budget for technical issues that arise? How do you deal with something as specific as a budget in a production that has so much, so many unknowns? This production is built on passion and love. So, um, <laughs> so I would say on client productions, we have contingencies. Um, and here the contingency is like, how many of us will give up our weekend to solve something? Uh, because it has to be solved because the audience is coming and we have to figure it out. And then we all just put the hours in to lift it over the threshold. And we've been really grateful to have the um, financial support from HP and all of the hardware. Um, but really these productions, they can be quite costly. And we've been, I would say our whole team has been building this on heart. Well, that's a nice note to end it on. But we have a lot of heart. <laughs> um, no, a really amazing, amazing amount of heart that shows in your work and that shows in your answers. And um, I'm so grateful for the opportunity to have gotten to sit here with you guys this afternoon and, and chat about all your work and this amazing experience that is, you know, has now been brought to the U.S. <laughs> it had its international debut, and now it's coming. It's coming closer uh, into into the the grasp of everyone here who's watching today, and that's exciting. Um, an exciting step on this journey. So we now, everyone here has a sense of what they get to look forward to, and hopefully also walk away a little bit inspired by all of your work and ability to sort of make dreams a reality. This wonderful note to end on. Thank you all so much for being a part of this event. Thank you to the audience. I know that I've learned a lot about all of the uh, technical and writing and audience uh, interaction, all these exciting parts of the production. And you mentioned Culture Hub earlier and how they were a part of the process. We have an event on Monday featuring Culture Hub. They're going to be speaking with us. I uh, love their works and their projects. So I hope that if you want to attend another free event on Monday, check out our website, Reconnect. Thank you all again. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day and let's keep in touch and uh, appreciate all of your time. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for having us. Yeah, thank, thank you, you everyone. Thank you.